Welcome, deputations. Thank you, individuals and organizations, for coming to the special meeting of the Health Services Panel to express your views on the regulation of medical beauty treatments and procedures. I'd like to remind you that your views and also your submissions will not be covered and exempted by the Legislative Council Powers and Privileges Ordinance. In other words, you will have to, to take legal responsibility for whatever you say here and also for the views expressed in your submissions. Let us say that Channel 0 is flawed, Channel 1 is Cantonese, Channel 2 is English interpretation. You will have three minutes each. Please try to be concise and precise. If you have more views to express, please do so in a written form. Now we can start the second session. Number at uh, the first organization, the Hong Kong Ophthalmological so Society President, Dr. Nancy Yun. Thank you, Chairman and members. English, because uh, we have prepared in English. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, uh, on behalf of the, of the Hong Kong Ophthalmological Society, we believe that there is a need to have a more comprehensive regulatory framework to regulate medical beauty treatment and procedures. We have referred to the document provided to us, and we agree that the List A aesthetic practices in Document 1NO2-12-13 uh, 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 provided as a PDF file to us should only be performed by registered medical practitioners. And the procedure in List A aesthetic practices should be considered as medical procedures. Uh, for those in the non-invasive list, uh, it would be uh, very important if it's near the eye region, it has to be done by medical practitioners. And besides all the medical procedures, including beauty treatment, procedures involving the use of class 3B or class 4 lasers should only be performed by registered medical practitioners because these are the laser which have high energy that can have uh, injury to the eye if directly applied to the eye. And uh, for the regulatory and disciplinary powers for the medical professions, uh, we agree that it should be done by the Medical Council of Hong Kong, and therefore the medical beauty treatment and procedures should be under the governance of the Medical Council of Hong Kong. All along, the training of ophthalmologists involves management of ocular and periocular conditions, and ophthalmologists have been performing some of the non-invasive minimally invasive and the invasive procedures in the list A aesthetic practices in the document provided. And we feel that we should have representatives in the relevant working groups related to our practice in the future. So this uh, uh, includes all the comments from the Hong Kong Pharmacological Society. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next, uh, the College of Ophthalmologists of Hong Kong, Dr. Hunter Yun. The College of Ophthalmologists of Hong Kong, Dr. Hunter Yun. Actually, the views of the college uh, are very similar to the society, and uh, that is what Dr. Nancy Yun just now, we have the same views. We don't have any new points to add. Thank you. We have already given you a submission. Next one, from the VTC, Beauty Care and Hairdressing Training Board of Vocational Training Council, Mr. Jackie Choi. Thank you, Chairman, members, and industry representatives. I am the Chairman of the Beauty Care and Hairdressing Training Board of the VTC. I'm Jackie Choi. I'd like to thank the Health Services Panel for the invitation, and I'm attending the meeting on behalf of that training board. In this incident, the training board agrees that we should regulate the use of medical procedures, that we should have a safety code. We also are of the view that the operators of such equipment should be provided with um, quality and professional training. And I'd like to give you more details. Just now I have heard from the first session many views, and I understand members would like to know more about uh, beauty training. The VTC has always provided different kinds of skill tests and professional competency assessment for different industries, including the beauty industry. In 2007, we have already started the competency test for operators of IPL. 
intense pulsed light, and it stipulates that these people, when they sit the test, must have already got. A definite number of hours in the industry that they should have the experience before they can apply for sitting the test. They must have professional beauty knowledge, and also they must understand uh, something about the use of light. And we understand that the test has been conducted rather well in the past few years, and we have not seen any particular incidents resulting from the use of such procedures. The Industry has followed the proposals of the administration, and they have been forthcoming in enhancing their professional skills. In recent years, the beauty industry has been progressing fast. In order to encourage the industry to progress with the times, the VTC has acted in accordance with the qualification framework managed by the Education Bureau. We have been helping to set the standards. We hope we can. Uh, promote a scoring system to promote continuing professional education and development. We hope that beauty industry workers can undergo um, in-service training in order to enhance their competency. I have worked in the beauty industry for over 30 years. We are of the view that in the past 20 years, the beauty industry has been very conscientious in undertaking self-enhancement, and we can see that the public and also the council here have spoken out about the beauty industry. We have been working very hard to enhance the profession, and many people have joined this beauty care and hairdressing training board to help enhancing the industry. And we can see that we have been very successful. I hope that from now on, the beauty industry can continue to make use of equipment, and we hope that the medical incident this time around will not stifle the development of the beauty industry. Thank you very much. Next, Dr. Raymond Ma of the Hong Kong College of Otohinolarin. Gologists. Allow me to use English, please. I have deep concern about the recent medical incident of four patients after receiving intravascular infusion and then later developing uh, septic shock, leading to one death and an inability parlor. The mishap is an ex example of a high risk procedure which is not evidence based, being carried out in a non regulated premise, a beauty parlor, by a medical practitioner without serious concern on its risk. We strongly advocate that high-risk procedures, aesthetic or cosmetic, should only be performed by qualified medical practitioners with the necessary training, putting the safety of our patients or our consumers first. There is a need to classify these procedures according to the level of to our patients or consumers in order to differentiate the high-risk procedures from the low-risk, non-invasive procedures. We strongly advocate that any such, any such procedures for our patients or clients must be evidence-based and only performed with the best interest in mind. If there is, if there is, no, if there is no evidence-based, we have reservation on their use. The premises for carrying out these procedures are important, and invasive procedures, even with minimal risk, should only be carried out by qualified practitioner, medical practitioners in regulated premises. There is a need to review Chapter 165 and Chapter 343, which do not provide sufficient regulation of private health care premises, ambulatory medical centers, and non medical facilities like beauty parlors. Plastic, face of plastic surgery is one of the main subspecialty areas in ENT practice. It is an integral part of training and examination for higher surgical trainees in our specialty, and is an integral part of our practice. Continuous medical education is an important aspect of good practice. Our college has, together with the two university departments, run regular courses and conferences in this aspect. Commission training courses on facial plastic sex surgery have also been run with the hospital authority. Our college is ready to contribute advice and further input on these pertinent issues related to the regulation of the procedures that can be done in beauty parlors, and last to provide credentialing advice on invasive aesthetic procedures. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, 
Members, if you'd like to speak in English or Mandarin, you are welcome to do so. We are trilingual here. That won't be a problem. Next one. We have Beauty Sky International Limited, Mr. Chung Wai Ting, Director. Good afternoon, members. I represent the suppliers. Beauty Sky is involved in the wholesaling of medical or beauty equipment. At our level, we would classify the different kinds of equipment before selling to clients. If we sell to doctors, the factories that make use of uh, that, that manufacture the equipment would already classify what equipment can be used by who. For medical beauty equipment, they are different from ordinary beauty equipment. And not all manufacturers can supply medical equipment. Therefore, we believe that the beauty industry should support legislation and examination for our industry members. I also believe that the industry members will agree that beauticians should take out a license for IPL and laser operations. As far as we know, when doctors studied medicine, they were not taught how to operate laser or IPL equipment. They rely on beauticians to instruct them how to use such equipment. Laser and IPL treatment courses were actually performed by nurses on some occasions, not necessarily by doctors. So I'd like the administration to consider such an approach. If injection or Botox is involved, then doctors should be the operator, not beauticians. In the course of legislation, operators, including beauty parlors and customers, are, have doubts and worries because they're worried that after legislation, whether or not they can still use their existing equipment and facilities. And of course, uh, recently, our business has dropped drastically, at least by 40 to 50 percent. So I hope that when the administration legislates to regulate the beauty industry, it will not kill, so to speak, the whole industry. Our industry is not too big. Oh, sorry, time's up. We're not a very big industry, but we would like you to understand that uh, we have about 10,000 employees or members. And in Hong Kong, we have a free economy. I'd like to say that in Asia, Hong Kong's uh, beauty industry ranks first. Uh, just last month, uh, in a beauty expo, a global expo, Hong Kong ranked second in terms of scale. And all Hong Kong brand names were displayed in this expo. Well, sorry, maybe you can supplement with written submissions. Next. Hong Kong Council for Accreditation of Ac Academic and Vocational Qualifications. The head, uh, Ms. Catherine Epp. Mr. Chairman, members, friends, on behalf of the Hong Kong Council for Accreditation of Academic and Vocational Qualifications, I'm attending this meeting. Our council is a statutory body and the authority for qualifications and accreditation. We are to accreditate training institutions and educational institutions such that their programs will attain the set standards. 
in order to discharge our duties, we've actually got four processors for accreditation. And accreditation criteria have been set. Now, these criteria are to allow operators to have a good quality assurance mechanism. We have to ensure that they have sufficient resources to organize training courses. And we're also concerned that upon completion of the training, the trainees can possess the expertise and knowledge. So we'll inspect the curriculum contents, method of examination, and so forth. All these are accreditation criteria. As to individual industries, their conduct, regulation, requirement for entrance, etc., they are to be determined by the respective industries themselves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Next speaker is from the Provisional Hong Kong Academy of Nursing, Professor Che Sek Ying. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. We have a number of points to make. The public should be accorded the first and foremost consideration. We have to define high-risk and non-high-risk operations. For high-risk procedures, we don't support a broad-brush approach. That is, we don't really, really require registered and qualified personnel for each and every act. I think we should listen to the voices of the industry as well as those of the professionals. There should be inclusion. In terms of leveling, at lower levels, registered nurses or advanced practice nurses may suffice. They don't need to work in registered premises and facilities. It depends on the complexity and invasiveness of the procedure. At higher levels, in terms of regulation, Acts should be performed by medical professionals and there must be and they must be performed in regulatory facilities. When accreditation is required, their governance, risk manage, risk management, personnel quality and regulation of equipment and facilities should be assessed. In the course of development as our council, as our academy is on professional development, on top on the basis of public interest, we provide training to the professionals. Some procedures, no matter where they are performed, there should be written consent from the parties concerned. And when clients undergo these procedures, they should have a fair chance to understand what risks they're facing. So much for my presentation. Thank you. Next, Dr. Dominic Zhang Ngai Chong, Council Member of the Hong Kong College of Pathologists. Dr. Ji Ji. And myself is a clinical microbiologist. I'd like to raise a few points. Uh, as discussed earlier, um, the, the distinction between cosmetic and high-risk procedure to myself is highly relevant, uh, not just in the sense of being invasive or not. Even those not invasive, it might carry uh, a substantial risk that merits uh, regulations, as pointed out earlier by uh, colleagues, like the use of laser. Uh, whether we can allow some uh, rooms uh, within the invasive group uh, say sort of exceptions uh, based on the competence of the practitioner, as we heard earlier from the cosmetic industry. Uh, that could uh, uh, be discussed further. Um, I would like to focus particularly on those high risk, or so, so to speak, the invasive groups, uh, which uh, 
So micro budgets is deeply concerned because of the potential and really realistic side effects of infection, which could be fatal uh, in many cases. Um, to, to us, like disinfection or sterilization, is like, very straightforward, but indeed it might not be the case. There are incidents uh, you heard every now and then, even in the most strictly regulated uh, 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 the uh, department of sterility department. There could be incidents, and therefore we need a very uh, well thought, uh, highly regulated bundle of cares, including training, supervisions, uh, equipment monitoring, feedback system. Uh, therefore, all, all these has to be put in place, uh, especially their procedure involving the manipulation of uh, blood or blood products, not to mention the sort of culturing it and then we infuse or we inject it into the patient's body. All these require the highest level of uh, aseptic uh, facilities and uh, manipulation protocols. That has to be uh, fully trained and uh, supervised. Otherwise, uh, it's bound to occur with incidents that, that can be fatal. And with this, I'd like to conclude my suggestions. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Next speaker, Dr. Samuel Kwok, Honorary Secretary of the Association of Private Medical Specialists of Hong Kong. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members and friends. First of all, I'd like to thank you for according the Association of Private Medical Specialists of Hong Kong to speak at this meeting. From the position of specialists, medical specialists, uh, we would like to put forth a few points. For beauty procedures and medical procedures, they should be separated in terms of surgeries and procedures. We have to understand what surgeries or services come under which profession. As for the method of differentiation, it really depends on whether it's invasive for the patient. Anything that is invasive and will create a wound on the patient should be regulated, including Botox injection, IPL injection, blood um, extraction or blood injection and so forth. The only procedure for the beauty industry to perform may be skin peeling. And some procedures may go deep into the skin and may be highly invasive. Those should be regulated and performed by medical professionals. If uh, general anesthetics or partial anesthetics are to be performed, it should be for the medical profession. And within the medical profession, we have uh, different specialties. So the Academy of Medicine may have to promulgate guidelines for the observance of the medical profession. As for facilities and premises, as we're talking about equipment, which are ever advancing, we have to address that concern. And I'm also concerned about excessively exaggerating advertisements, which may lure customers into receiving certain procedures or services. So guidelines have to be published to regulate advertisements. And informed consent must be obtained for any act to be performed by a doctor. The patient has the right to know which doctor is performing what on him. Next.
next with Dr. Peter Pang from the Hong Kong Private Hospitals Association. The Hospital Association would like to make the following points. Our aim is to safeguard the health and safety of general public. We need to define clearly what are the medical treatments and what are the beauty treatments. For medical treatments in bracket plastic, we'd like to take reference of what we use in Singapore. The need, we need to define what medical treatments need specialists to carry out, and this can be defined by the Academy of Medicine. We need to define what medical treatments can be carried out by non-specialists who already receive training and accreditations. For new treatments and new equipments and tests, they should be registered and be regulated. We need to regulate also the premises, the place where we carry out the aesthetic medical treatment. And these are the points we'd like to make. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman and ladies and gentlemen. I think the calls for stronger regulation of cosmetic medical practice in Hong Kong are loud and clear. I propose to set up the guidelines on cosmetic and aesthetic practices for aestheticians and doctors in Hong Kong and divide into cosmetic practices and aesthetic practices. The procedures are divided into four levels according to skills required, knowledge required and also the complexity of the procedures. And the personnel who perform this should obtain the minimum requirement of competence. All as a text, uh, aestheticians practicing cosmetic services should have accreditation of training and license of cosmetic practice in Hong Kong. All high-risk invasive procedures of cosmetic practices, including chemical pills, microdermabrasion, medical lasers, intense pulse light, radio frequency infrared, other devices for skin tightening, photodynamic, photoneumatic therapies, external lipolysis, including heat and ultrasound, that are performed by aestheticians should have doctor supervision. All aestheticians should comply with the code of conduct of guidelines set by new governing bodies, the Cosmetic Practice Public Safety Committee. All doctors practicing aesthetic services, including Botox injection, fillers, injections, valvectomy, scare therapy, uh, vascular lasers, and anti-aging therapy, including blood products, should have accreditation of training and obtain certificate of competence of related procedures. All doctors practicing aesthetic services should comply with the guidelines and set up by um, a new uh, governing bodies like the Singapore uh, APOC, Aesthetic Practice Oversight Committee. All high-risk procedures of aesthetic practices should be performed by specialists who have obtained certificate of competence or have related specialist registration. Any aestheticians or doctors who perform any cosmetic or aesthetic procedures that is not in accordance with the guidelines set by these governing the bodies will be deemed as unethical to the profession and such an aesthetician or doctor may be liable for disciplinary action by the governing bodies or medical council. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Next, uh, Ms. Mary Catherine Chang of the Pharmaceutical Society of Hong Kong. Chairman and members, recently a client received um, intravascular infusion by a doctor and she died and uh, we'd like to forward the following views. The administration should regulate um, any procedures with regard to the storage condition of human tissue and blood and it is just like the uh, storage of umbilical blood in order to make sure that these procedures are safe. All these operators which make use of such storage procedures should be subject of the application of licenses and the relevant authority should assess the qualification of the operator, the licensee and also the premises and whether all these are suitable. The collection and uh, storage activities should be conducted in appropriate um, premises and only 
to be undertaken by those who have received training. We can learn from the UK, the um, Eurozone, and also the US. Basically, a government body will issue licenses and also conduct um, inspections. Secondly, we should regulate uh, doctors' clinics and also beauty centers. The doctors should tell the uh, Department of Health what kind of premises they operate, including beauty parlors that they operate. And government officials should conduct regular inspection at these premises to make sure that the use and procurement and also storage of medicine uh, are done according to the law. And also, it should be ensured that the distribution of medicine is done in such a way that it is uh, protecting the health of the public and also the workers involved. In order to protect the interests of consumers, only those who have received professional training in that particular area should be allowed to undertake uh, high-risk aesthetic procedures. The administration should also require beauty parlors which uh, are involved in medium risk or high risk procedures to apply for a license and the Department of Health should also inspect these premises to make sure that they comply with the law. Number three, advertisements. I think the law should be uh, changed. At present, the Undesirable Medical Advertisements Ordinance um, stipulates that if uh, advertisements are taken out according to the schedule, uh, that would be banned. However, I think there should be some change to the law according with the present time so that there will be effective protection of public health. The most important thing is advertisement statements should be evidence-based. To protect consumers, false representations by uh, beauty parlors, say for example slimming uh, procedures, etc., those should be regulated as well. Thank you. Next, uh, Professor Joseph Lau, Chairman of the Medical Council of Hong Kong. There is a slogan at the uh, Medical Council, and that is we have to uh, stick to the professional standards of our profession to protect the public. Uh, it is a very impressive slogan, but we have a narrow scope of jurisdiction. We only regulate Western medical practitioners, and we do not have power to overlook the uh, health management organizations or private hospitals or even public hospitals. The DR incident has told us that unregulated medical procedures can do a lot of harm to the public. So as chairman of the Medical Council of Hong Kong, I'm of the view that the Hong Kong Society should seriously consider stepping up the legislation of the following points, which I think are important. Some of the um, items have been covered by previous speakers, and I won't go into the detail. First of all, I think there should be laws made to stipulate what are medical procedures or what are beauty procedures. There must be a very clear delineation between the two. In terms of invasive uh, behavior or, or procedure, if you say that is how medical procedures can be defined, I think that is simplistic. Say, for example, acupuncture or removing a pimple with a needle or making use of a needle to afford uh, tattooing, those are not medical procedures. But then there are non-invasive procedures like the use of laser. In fact, laser can be very invasive. So I hope members, you can give this very clear consideration in order to put a definition on medical procedures. And also I think different medical procedures would represent different kinds of um, invasion. Some must be undertaken by registered doctors and some even by specialist doctors. There should be different le degrees of regulation for different degrees of risk. Number three, I would say that whatever is injected into the human body should be regulated seriously. Say, for example, the collection of cells, uh, storage and culture of cells, and also the, make the use of blood products. I'm very concerned about umbilical blood and also stem cells, etc. Those have not been medically tested to be useful. Number four, the DR incident shows clearly that if a conglomerate uh, investor is not a doctor but he engages a few doctors to undertake procedures, the law actually can do very little about this uh, main operator of the um, health organization and we can only penalize the doctors. Last but not least, advertisements. 
four aspects, uh, because that has not been really mentioned by other speakers. Number one, private uh, organizations and undesirable advertisements. If they are not medically based, if they are just exaggerated in terms of the efficacy of the procedures, those should be seriously regulated. Number two, private hospitals. They may have a self constraint. Uh, self-restraint, but then sometimes they are also exaggerated. Number three, overseas medical organizations. They can disseminate messages on uh, TV in Hong Kong, uh, just like the dental procedures uh, that are available on the mainland. And last but not least, private doctors. They are now involved in uh, equipment advertisement and also baby formula advertisement. In fact, there was this case, Kwong Kok Hei and Medical Council. The court has said that we should balance freedom of speech with regulation. Now, I think the law should be amended. Uh, this is for members' consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Dr. Wong Chi Wai, Vice President of the Hong Kong Dental Association. Thank you, Chairman. The stance of the Dental Association is that all procedures and treatments done within the oral a cavity should be only done by medical practitioners. And I'm talking about dentists, of course, and only in regulated uh, premises, meaning dentist clinics. Some oral procedures uh, must be emphasized, like dental bleaching, mouth guard provision, taking dental impression, dental laser treatment, and uh, giving dental medical diagnosis, etc. And uh, also like uh, to say more about dental bleaching, because this is very uh, common and very popular. There are a lot of advertisements on dental bleaching nowadays. Usually, only dentists can judge whether the teeth can be bleached and should be bleached. We do not object to dental uh, beauty, but you, it must be done appropriately. And even if uh, the teeth have to be bleached, we have to first of all do something to protect the teeth. There has been uh, a case where people went to a beauty parlor to do dental bleaching. In fact, the, the, the patient actually had a um, serious periodontal illness and what he or she needed was um, scaling and, and polishing, not bleaching. And therefore, we'd like to make uh, three uh, proposals. First, to restrict beauty service companies and other non-clinical service providers from offering unproven treatment. B, to review and further reinforce the undesirable medical advertisements ordinance. And number three, to clearly define the scope of work that beauty care personnel or protect practitioners must not undertake. I'd like to say that a few years ago, we saw this TV advertisement and also press advertisement saying that something can cure periodontics. At that time, we told the Legislative Council then that the active ingredient of that matter was just vitamin C and lysosome. And uh, doctors and dentists would know that those are not for curing periodontics. But then we were told that this is not against the law because periodontics is not a, a disease listed in the law. The Hong Kong Dental Association would urge the administration to take quick action, and we are very happy to cooperate with the uh, administration. Thank you. Next one. Dr. Andros Chan, Deputy Chairman of the Hong Kong Medical and Healthcare Device Industries Association. Thank you, Chairman and members. Thank you, uh, other guests. On behalf of the association, we'd like to put forward our views but actually, in the first session and also in this session, many other deputations have uh, covered the points I like to make, and I won't repeat those. And you can refer to our submissions. And I would just like to say something that has not been mentioned. We said a lot about differentiating between medical procedures and beauty procedures and also regulating those. But then we have missed out something, and that is regulation of medical facilities or equipment. Very often, in 2004, under the Department of Health, the Medical Device Control Office was set up, and the objective was to regulate medical um, devices according to the degree of risks involved. But eight years have passed, and we cannot see anything resulting from the setting up of the office. We support that in Hong Kong, 
Apart from differentiating medical procedures and beauty procedures, the devices should also be a matter of concern. Singapore, Malaysia, at that time, at uh, two, in 2004, did not have the regulations. But now they have already legislated. However, in Hong Kong, we still do not have any legislation. And looking back, I think we should uh, make up for lost time. In 2007, the MDCO did an, a regulatory impact assessment. And in 2010, there was a business impact assessment done. My understanding is that they should be able to furnish something for discussion by this panel. But we are very disappointed because all these years, the progress has been very slow. When a medical practitioner or when a beauty practitioner makes use of the device, but the device is not regulated, then it may create more problems. Since you have done so much advanced work, I think we should move faster to regulate medical devices. We hope that the LegCo, in particular this panel, can expedite the whole process by urging the Bureau and the Department of Health to legislate as early as possible. That is to lay a foundation. Then there may have to be other regulatory measures before we can put public health and hygiene under a better environment. Next, uh, Ms. Sabrina Chan, Executive Director of the Hong Kong Association of the Pharmaceutical Industry. First of all, the Man Rock Institute would like to emphasize uh, that uh, the four injections in the recent uh, incident were performed by a doctor. Doctors are sacred. Who else can we trust other than the doctor? And apart from a doctor, who can we seek treatment? So the trust in doctors must not be undermined. Dr. Leung Ka Lau, if somebody interferes with your relationship with your patients and doubt your performance, what will you feel? So all doctors should be responsible for ensuring the safety of medical equipment as well as medical procedures. Doctors should be held fully responsible for their acts. Where the injection is done, how and what must be regulated. And both the doctor and the patient should bear responsibility after reaching consent on certain performances. And the buck must not be passed to beauty parlors. Doctors are to regulate the conduct of their peer doctors. Well, let me s tell you what doctors wear when they become a medical practitioner. They seriously promise that they will give their whole life to serve people. They will be grateful. They will follow their conscience and dignity. Patients' health must be the first and foremost concern. They have to do their best to, to uphold the honor and convention of doctors. They should give the greatest respect to human beings. Even under threat, they will not make use of their medical knowledge to act against human rights and civic rights. With their own reputation, they voluntarily make that pledge. The Lion Rock Institute would like our doctors to remember and honor their promises to patients. They must not to damage the sacred relationship between doctors and patients. Thank you. Next, the Hong Kong Association of the Pharmaceutical Industry, Ms. Sabrina Chan. Well, we support the Singaporean model, that is to separate medical procedures and beauty procedures. And all procedures should be performed by qualified professionals in qualified premises. Regulation is a very important ancillary measure. Very often, for beauty purposes, products injected into patients can be divided into three categories. First, medication, like Botox. Medication is tested in phase in relation to the safety, etc., before they get registered. The environment of manufacturing Packaging, quality assurance have to undergone very serious regulation. 
medical equipment like Phyllis must be regulated. But in Hong Kong, they're under a voluntary registration system only. There's no mandatory regulatory mechanism. So, in this regard, uh, we have very diverse standards for blood extracts and other forms of extracts. They form the third category of products. So for invasive uh, treatment that call for injection, there must be regulation on the relevant equipment and medical products. We would like the administration to complete the legislative procedure as soon as possible. Records must be kept in a good manner such that we can trace the use of medication. There must be a code of ethics for doctors and beauticians. Doctors and beauticians should explain clearly to customers what products are used, what risks will be involved, etc. Next. Hong Kong Chiropractors Association, the Ethics Chairperson, Dr. David Kosman. Uh, chiropractors are not involved with drugs. We don't prescribe drugs and we don't uh, um, distribute drugs. If, but our patients need medication. So we use medical doctors. We refer to their office. Some chiropractors have a medical doctor in their office. And in such a case, it's run like a medical clinic. The medical portion is. Uh, we offer a broad statement to Hong Kong Chiropractors Association with health care protection of the public should be standard across the board. Uh, health and beauty seems to have been placed under one umbrella by the newspapers and magazines, and the public might be under the impression that all clinics and spas are under, all under the same regulations. Um, the public wants health and beauty, and advertising drives them to highly marketed shops, perhaps with claims that aren't substantiated. Uh, but there's no regulation. Chiropractic is regulated, and the regulated clinics, which are not allowed to advertise, such as chiropractic clinics and medical clinics, have less exposure, so the public goes to where the exposure is, but they're not protected. Newspapers sell advertising, and apparently those advertisers, um, uh, those, uh, apparently it promotes those advertisers. So the public moves in that direction. The direction requires regulation, including education and advertising, if health is one of their claims. Um, with regulation, there's education uh, and regulation in the use of modalities that are within the scope of practice. Um, with regulation, which we have, um, there's a CPD, continuing, uh, uh, continuing Professional Development or Education Program. Doctors of chiropractic are regulated in advertising and therefore are regulated in misleading claims and competing through free fee promotions. Um, having a, having a regula regulatory council uh, has teeth, and without teeth, there's no policing the profession. Um, the media, unfortunately, has afforded strong power in its attempt to set standards uh, and with the goal of financial gain. Those standards are potentially misleading and healthy and permits wealthy groups to pass off as legitimate health care providers. Non-registered clinics and spas have more rights and less restriction than regulated registered uh, health professionals. So the question is, is it, a, is it health and beauty, is it a health and beauty industry or a health and beauty profession? Because professions have ethics. Our opinion is that registration with codes are a good thing and they might be tough to implement, but they're a good thing. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Ms. Jacqueline Kwan, Business, Deve Business Development Director of the Oster Beauty Company Limited. I'd like to say something on behalf of the beauty industry. I agree that we should clarify and regulate the beauty industry. We must draw a line between medical procedures and beauty procedures. Where in the course, we have to make reference to the history of the beauty industry and practices in other jurisdictions. In fact, the medical profession is well defined. 
injection and invasive procedures are medical acts that must be performed by doctors. As for traditional developments of the beauty industry, from massage, product use, use of equipment, etc., we already have an experience of 30 years. For the use of laser and IPL, we've been using them for over 10 years for beautification. And training courses on the use of IPL and accreditation frameworks have been set up, though on a voluntary basis. Standards have been set, and our industry members must have a certain period of experience before they can be given accreditation. It's a trend to use beauty-related equipment. And internationally, there's a regulatory framework in general for the use of equipment. For example, in the use of laser for skin peeling, or hair peeling. By means of training, we can allow professionals to carry out such procedures. Platforms such as the VTC, the Hong Kong Council, for accreditation of academic and vocational qualifications are some examples. And there must be annual accreditation programs to ensure the standard of our professionals. And the regulatory framework must be formulated with the development of the industry in mind. Next. The Federation of Medical Societies of Hong Kong, Dr. Ying Shun Yun. The DR incident is not a purely medical incident or purely beauty incident. It's actually a natural development of our society. Many doctors and beauty parlors conduct beauty procedures. Just now somebody said that Hong Kong is the second largest market in this regard in Hong Kong, and with over 200,000 industry members. Our industry may have an impact on the 7 million people of Hong Kong. There is a clash of value in terms of humanitarianism between the medical profession and the beauty industry. The positive feedback is that commission may be obtained by beauticians who will not refuse to perform certain procedures. However, medical professionals have to follow a code. Just now we're told very clearly that Doctors cannot place advertisements. But what about uh, products that are not medically, medically certified? We now have numerous of them, as well as numerous advertisements on them. Some doctors may refer patients to other doctors, but for commercial establishments, we cannot guarantee that they'll refer the customer to the appropriate personnel. Rather, they'll refer, make a referral to an establishment that gives them the biggest benefit. Let me put forward three points. We must regulate establishments that provide beauty services. We must regulate beauty-related advertisements. We must regulate medical centers and beauty centers, including a licensing regime. Fourthly, I hope that the administration can strengthen its regulation on the promotional materials provided by beauty parlors and for these so-called medical treatment, like those related to stem cells, there must be sufficient regulation. 
and I would like our medical colleagues to follow closely their code. Mr. So you are Vice President of the Society of Hospital Pharmacists of Hong Kong. In October, we did some survey and we found that amongst the um, beauty procedures, uh, including the whitening uh, injections, making use of vitamin C, etc., um, actually in 2011 in May, the Filipino Federation of uh, Medicine has issued a um, warning about skin whitening and the use of the relevant substance. It is said that there are um, grave health effects. We have analyzed the situation and we have seen a lot of uh, the claims which are not evidence-based. We are of the view that a lot of the um, advertisement is uh, exaggerated and misleading. Therefore, our society would say that if advertisements are not clinically and evidence-based, they should be regulated and the information should not be allowed to reach the public. If there are procedures that have not been clinically tested, those should not be done by people at beauty parlors and not even doctors should be able to operate them. And then with regard to other procedures that are clinically based, um, including Botox, uh, which have been proved to be able to tackle wrinkles, then they should be done by trained and qualified doctors. Last but not least, we hope that the administration can educate the public in the interim to know the truth about um, beauty, medicine, and also the risks involved. We don't want anyone else to die from it. Thank you. The Hong Kong Society of Dermatology and Venereology, Dr. Yong Chi Kang. Thank you, Chairman. I, re I represent this society, and I like to say that first of all, we have to protect public interest and public safety. As for the definition of medical procedures, we have the following views. If you're talking about the skin surface, now if it is invasive, in other words, if there is a blood coming out, if there is a lesion or ulcer, then these should be termed invasive. That's for your reference. Secondly, the risks, a risk of infection, for example. This is our biggest concern. And number three, long-term side effect. For example, that there can be a scar or a permanent change of outlook. These are risks. As for injections and the use of medication, these can be listed as medical procedures. As you know, many entities engage doctors to um, do these procedures in order to bypass the regulation. But as uh, Mr. Leung has said, if such organizations make use of doctors to do these procedures, then the directors of such entities must be medical staff as well so that uh, we can regulate them better. As for the use of high-risk procedures, there should be an informed consent on the part of the client. We should pay attention to how the procedures are explained to the client and there should be better documentation of the explanation given to the client or patient. We have to explain the advantages and the risks involved. All that should be documented for easier regulation. Last but not least, uh, advertisements. We have to understand that many of them are misleading and are false representations. And we must come to a unanimous view in order to uh, regulate these advertisements and protect the public. That's all from me. Thank you. That's all for deputations in the second session. Now I'd like to invite the Under Secretary to see whether she would like to respond to the views expressed. Thank you, Chairman. On behalf of the Bureau, I'd like to thank the deputations which have spoken in the second session. You may be from the beauty industry or you may be from the professions. Thank you for coming to speak to us on the regulation of medical beauty treatments and procedures. Thank you for your views on a possible framework of regulation. We have heard you. Let me try to separate your views into different categories. Just like in session one, many deputations are of the view that we should 
differentiate between med medical and beauty procedures. And this is because there are risks involved. And also, these procedures can be invasive. Actually, in one of the task forces under the steering committee, we are going to discuss this. Because if the definition is not done right, the public can be harmed. And as you said, infection could result from invasive procedures and the public safety can be undermined. Secondly, I have heard you talk about people. In other words, who should be allowed to do what? Should it be doctors, nursing staff, or beauticians? And I have also heard a lot of voices from the beauty industry saying that actually within the industry, there is this qualification framework and uh, practitioners are required to reach a certain level. And also you have talked about ethical standards. Number three. You have mentioned medical equipment, premises, and medication. And uh, I th heard you say that these should be regulated. And number four, advertisements. If the advertisements are undesirable advertisements or if there are claims made, many deputations have said that these should be appropriately regulated. Since we have the Deputy Secretary of Commerce and Economic Development. Maybe I can defer to her uh, to tell you about uh, how the law is evolving. Thank you. Some deputations have mentioned the uh, Trade Descriptions Ordinance, and it is said that some advertisements could be false or misleading. Actually, just in the last session of LegCo, we amended the Trade Descriptions Ordinance. The amended ordinance has not been given effect, but we hope it will come into operation in 2013. The ordinance covers uh, a whole spectrum of industries, and the amendments have created a few more penalties, including what you mentioned, and that is false advertisement or false trade description. And that is whether it be commodities or services. If the description is false or misleading to a crucial extent, uh, that is against the law. And also, if uh, material information is omitted so that consumers would make a different choice, then uh, that is against the law as well. I hope that we can implement the amended ordinance as soon as possible. Then the Customs and Excise Department will be able to enforce it. Together with the Department of Health, the CNED can review the beauty industry and other industries to see uh, there are uh, illegal acts. No more supplement from you, Under Secretary. I'd just like to say that um, I'd like to reiterate that we have already set up the steering committee on the review of private health care facilities. Uh, the steering committee has already had the first meeting, and under it, there are four task forces. And these task forces will be covering a lot of uh, what you said. I promise that your voices and views will be referred to the task forces for discussion. And hopefully after discussion, we can report back to you. Members, any questions for the deputations? Or would you like to take up any point with the administration? Dr. Joseph Lee. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to thank the second batch of deputations for coming. 
I heard you say that um. Well, actually, you are a little different from the first session deputations. You said that in certain premises, some medical beauty procedures can be done, but it is said that there is no regulation. It is just that the act itself is regulated, but not the premises. Uh, what facilities there should be at the premises? It seems the premises are not subject to any licensing procedure. And also, talking about high risk and invasive acts. Now, I don't know, but uh, I like to ask the beauty industry. Do you ask your clients to sign a consent form? Say, for example, you explain to them that this time around you are going to receive Botox injection and your face may be swollen, uh, things like that. Do you ask them to sign a consent form first? Whether you are a doctor or a beautician, if you are involved in medical beauty procedures, uh, first of all, I'd like to know whether your premises are regulated. And secondly, do you ask people to sign a consent form? And then I have a question for the administration. I don't know what answers it can give us. Will the administration consider adopting administrative procedures for the time being so that you let us know which uh, procedures can be done in what premises. Maybe you can have some administrative guidelines for the time being. And also, you can say that if premises are where high-risk procedures are to be uh, done, then at least uh, people should sign a consent form. I'm, I find it regrettable that the Consumer Council is not represented today. Uh, would anyone like to respond? Do you ask people to sign a consent form before you uh, provide the service. Would you like to speak? Whoever who, who would like to speak, please raise your hands. Mr. Zhong. Yes, we always do. Many beauty parlors, if uh, they are larger in scale, always ask their clients to sign a consent form. If laser or intense pulsed light and also filler, Botox injections are involved. We always ask clients to sign consent forms. What about premises? I think it should be a question for the administration. From what I know, there is absolutely no regulation whatsoever. Can you adopt administrative uh, procedures? Thank you. Dr. Lee. Would there be guidelines for premises? Well, this is exactly one of the points to be discussed by the task forces. I'd like to thank Dr. Lee. We hope that something can be done. And also, I'd like to say that at this stage, the Department of Health has already stepped up control. We have a representative from the Department of Health. Dr. Lee, can you say something? As at the 26th of November, we have inspected over a thousand advertisements covering different beauty procedures and we have discovered that over a hundred coming from 30 odd companies are suspected to be related to injections and invasive procedures. We have initiated contact with these beauty parlors. As of the 26th of November, we have visited 19, su 19 such beauty parlors and 18 claimed that the procedures are done by doctors and the other one has said that it is not providing the service anymore. And as at present, we have not seen any non-compliance. Well, I thank them for also answering on advertisements. Actually, I did not ask about advertisements, but then the administration has not answered my point on consent form. Would that also be your stance? Would you propose to the public that if they patronize beauty parlors in the interim, they should ask for a consent form from the beauty parlors? The sector has said that they provide the form, but is that the stance of the administration as well? That is before we have the legislation. Would you propose the public do that because it is some kind of protection for them? Uh, at least uh, there is some trace. 
Well, at present, if procedures are done by doctors, then actually within the professional code of ethics of doctors, if they are involved in uh, procedures of any degree of risk, a consent form should be signed by the client or patient. But we can relate the view back to the task forces for further consideration. Next, uh, Ms. Helena Wong. Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to thank all the deputations for coming to let us have your valuable views. My question is, when we talk about regulating the beauty industry, we have raised several points. One has to do with the sale of beauty products and whether we can introduce a cooling off period. There are many complaints and we have received those complaints ourselves. For example, when a patient is undergoing mask therapy, etc., etc., other products are advertised to them, saying that the products may protect uh, their liver or even their ovary, etc., etc. And eventually, some customers were lured into purchasing commodities that cost, say, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, if uh, a customer is misled into a procurement, uh, that is an offense. Now, what about this cooling off period? If a customer, after leaving a beauty parlor, queries the effectiveness of the product, then he should be allowed to refuse to buy the products. Now, we're talking about beauty services. Now, this piece of legislation is to be applied to beauty services. If we only rely on the Customs and Excise Department for law enforcement, it won't be very effective. Just now, it's said that the Department of Health should interfere. So what role does the Department of Health has in the whole process? And how can we specifically implement the legislation? And will the guidelines be published? Can consumer interests be safeguarded? And then I have a question for the industry. For the registration regime for beauty equipment, now I asked this question before. I'd like to listen to the views of the deputations. Be they doctors or members of the beauty industry? Any response about the cooling off period? That is for the registration. And what about registration of medical equipment? Please raise your hand if you'd like to respond. Dr. Chan? Yes, Dr. Chan? I'd also like to say something about medical equipment. Well, risks were mentioned just now. In fact, throughout the whole world, medical equipment is considered to be having a huge impact on consumer interests. In the UK, the US, uh, Taiwan, they have very clear guidelines. And there are a lot of references for us. Ever since 2004, Four, we set up a voluntary mechanism to list out the high-risk equipment. I believe it's now opportune for us to do it formally. And very often, medical equipment and beauty equipment are mixed together. Well, it's a bit difficult to define beauty equipment. So let's start with medical equipment. We have global standards, uh, WTO does have uh, some standards. So we don't need to argue because we already have global standards. So the profession is uh, very supportive of this. And the regulatory impact assessment has already been completed. 
last year. So we find it strange why it has not been implemented. I believe uh, breast uh, augmentation and other cosmetic surgeries elsewhere in the world all call for a cooling off period for breast expansion there's a two week cooling off period you mean two weeks before treatment yes but what about uh, after the completion of the surgery oh no more cooling off then as many speakers have said the fundamental issue is how to define high risk and low risk Members did ask the same question. The core question is how to define high risk. Let me have one more minute. The US, the EU and China set four surgeries as high risk. Tummy cut, fat extraction, skin eration and breast expansion and these have to be performed in clinics uh, with general or partial anesthetics so elsewhere in the world this is already done well let me supplement on Dr. Chan our association and Dr. Chan's association did talk to the administration about the legislations well, throughout the whole world, uh, they are regulating medical equipment. Hong Kong is lagging behind in this regard. A focus has been on laser equipment. But in fact, fillers for nose boosting, etc., actually belong to the category of medical equipment. Some eye drops are also medical equipment. Parallel goods and low quality goods can be found in the market, but it's difficult to trace them. So we very much agree that uh, the legislation on medical treatment should be implemented earlier. Well, thank you for letting me speak on the cooling off period. In fact, this issue was raised a few years ago. At that time, if I remember correctly, it's mainly because the practices in certain industries were not so desirable. They use threatening tactics. They prevent customers from leaving while they are receiving treatment, for example. So a cooling off period was proposed at that time. That is, during the cooling off period, the customer can get a refund. That is, he can go back to square one as if nothing has happened. In 2011, when we conduct a public consultation exercise on the commodities description ordinance, we talked to various industries on how the cooling off period should be implemented. At that time, we discovered that we had to think about a number of issues. For example, the duration of the cooling off period. Secondly, if a customer wants a refund in order to avoid disputes would a written agreement be required when the refund should be effected? Well, some members of the industry said that they might have ordered the materials already. So could costs be deducted from the refund? Now, at that time, as I said, a number of unscrupulous practices were discovered at that time. So we delink the commodities description amendment ordinance from beauty equipment and materials. 
we said that we would consider the cooling off period later and would consider when it should be implemented and how. As Mr. Wong said, how did this emerge? That is, why did we start to think about a cooling off period? Is because some customers complained that they were threatened into making a hasty decision. And sometimes they made a hasty decision. Afterwards, they served the internet and discovered that they were cheated. So, in the commodities description amendment ordinance, we tried to cover these problems. So, when it comes to law enforcement, we would like to grasp these problems better. Of course, we undertook to conduct another review where we heard the views of both sides. Well, in the first session, we heard different views from those that were heard in session two. Of course, it would be double protection for the customer if a refund can be offered. But just now in session one, we heard from some deputations that the Commodities Description Ordinance had already regulated unscrupulous practices or undesirable practices. Should a double protection be offered to a consumer? Well, for an honest businessman, if he does not resort to intimidation tactics, should he still be required to offer a refund to the customer? As regards law enforcement guidelines, we already promised guidelines for law enforcement. Back then, we heard some voices that urged us to regulate certain unlawful activities. Well, of course, I cannot twist out all unlawful activities in just one piece of legislation. Should we do it by way of examples or uh, easy illustrations? Well, in the next month or so, we'll be able to present you with a draft set of guidelines. We can certainly improve uh, on the draft. And we hope to implement the legislation next year. Talking about actual law enforcement, the main law enforcement agency will be the Customs and Excise Department. Well, the piece of legislation in question is simply about unscrupulous descriptions. For example, whether a certain product is uh, a cow's ligament or a deer's ligament, it may be different to tell. The service industry has to be covered as well. Some other industries have also to be covered. We'll cooperate with the Telecommunications Authority. Well, just now, some members and deputations mentioned misleading advertisements. The Customs and Excise Department and the Department of Health uh, have a great deal of room for collaboration. Well, just one more minute. I would like to ask Dr. Young a question. What about diagnosis before IPL? application. How are you going to differentiate uh, the different kinds of dark spots? Yes, diagnosis is very important. Judgment is very important. Sometimes uh, the practitioner may deem it a beauty issue, but uh, eventually the dark spot uh, may actually be cancer or cancer in its initial stage. 
and beauty procedures may not be able to control complications and may not be able to achieve the expected effect. Now, if if there's no further comment, I'd like to thank the deputations for coming to give us their views. Uh, I believe the steering committee will study all views received today in detail. Thank you very much.